Hello, my name isn't important, but what is important is what I'm about to tell you about this episode. So you may notice some interesting thing about this. So this episode is mainly talking about the King Kong films. Originally it was supposed to talk about about 7 out of the 8 Kong films. But due to how much raw footage there was, it took a bit of a while to edit this entire video. But while I was also editing this episode, I also made a review of Godzilla vs. Kong after watching it in theaters. And I realized that it would be better off to combine both videos together. So the review of Godzilla vs. Kong will be the end at the it will be at the end of the video and all that. But the thing is, I'm not going to change the outros or the intros of the videos. Oh, or it's in the introduction. I'm still going to say we're going to talk about seven King Kong movies. He's even though I'm now going to talk about eight out of this time nine King Kong movies thanks to Godzilla vs Kong. But the original outro for this episode of the SFO video show will be at the end of the video. So it's not going to be me saying so that's all the video. Oh, it's going to be, so that's all the episode. So yeah, that is a very quick in introduction there. Mine, sorry for some confusion there, and I do apologize for this video being late. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Aspo Video Show. I am your co-host, and today I'm staying alone. The reason why I have our other co-host, Leo, who is not here, is because uh, today we will be talking about the King Kong movies. We're going to talk about seven of them. We couldn't watch King Kong list, but the reason why, like, we're not going to talk with this with Leo and all that, is because Leo decided not to participate with me of watching all of the Kong movies. The day I asked him, "Hey, Leo, we gotta watch all these King Kong movies," and he goes, "Nah, nah, nah." Basically, we're refusing to actually sit down in order to actually participate within this episode. He seems very unfazed, to be honest. Is if of not appearing in this episode and all that, uh, or appearing in any episode of the Asphalt Video Show and all. So the conclusion comes to that Leo was too late to actually watch every single Kong movie in order to actually discuss it here. So I'm going to talk about all these films by myself. Usually when we talk about like, like let's say last time we actually have a discussion like this like, it was with the My Academia video which was last year. And that was one well and all that we had like a three person discussion. Now I'm sitting here alone because I couldn't convince nobody else to sit down any, to watch any King Kong movies. He's and all that. Just going to sit here alone and talk about seven of them. We're going to put time codes throughout this video and all that. Like what the uh, films we're going to talk about first and all. Where basically I discussed them all and why some of them are good. Okay, so let's begin. The first King Kong movie we have is the 1933 classic The King Kong. This is directed by Mary C. Cooper and I believe also Ernest B. Shoshak. Yep, they both produced it and directed it. The screenplay was by James A. Cameron and Ruth Rose. Ruth Rose was the wife of uh, Mary C. Cooper at the time and all of them. And I have the DVD here. I'm going to simply put it up here to know what films we're talking about. In any case, the story revolves the character of Carl Denham, um, who basically he wants to film a movie at a mysterious island. So he basically travels over there. They heard of the mysterious god or monster known as Kong. Um, so basically, they travel over there, but the villagers warn them to get out, so they hop back to the boat. But at night time, the villagers kidnap Faye Ray and all that and take her back to the giant gate. There they have her, her basically being, well, sacrificed. I'm not saying sacrificed, but basically tied up for the giant ape known as King Kong, or just simply Kong. Then gets Faye Ray and runs to the jungle. Now the crew and Carl Demon has to now explore the jungles themselves in order to find Faye Ray. What else I could say about this movie that nobody else has to say? This movie is really great. This is one of like, the greatest films within like the film history and all that. I really like the film itself and all that. It has a charm within the stop motion animation and all that. Uh, and also you are amazed of how they could achieve this back in the 1930s and all that. How they actually done the stop motion was done by Willis O'Brien and all that. Who before this began to start making like animated stop motion short films which was funded by Thomas Edison and he then worked on the Lost World in 1925 then in 1932 started working on a project 
I think it was 1932 or it was ni yeah 1932 yeah or 1931. They started on working on a project known as Creation and all that, uh, where basically it had a si a semi similar story to Kong, but not really a semi similar story to Kong. Actually, the DVD itself and the bonus features does have like has a seven part documentary and all that, but it does have. Have like a basically them reading out the outline to him while with visuals and all that, but unfortunately he kind of went on over budget and all that. And ARKO was like, man, this movie is going to get uh, get us uh, like in bankrupt and all that. So they actually hired Marion C. Cooper to be the ex pro executive producer of the project. He goes, okay, I will be the producer, but you gotta help me uh, with my gorilla picture here. I have. Because at this time, Mary C. Cooper was also basically working on the assumed to be project known as King Kong. Um, so they're like, oh, okay, they are curious like, and they decided to actually cancel creation or to work for Mary C. Cooper's King Kong. That was what Brian tried to convince and Cooper that, hey, we, we could use stop motion effects in order to do oh, this movie you want to do. And, but Mary C. Cooper was already thinking to actually use the stop motion effects, so they actually worked pretty well with that. The stop motion armatures, not really the armatures themselves, but more like, more like the like the skin, like what's outside the armatures, were done by, I uh, basically was done by Marcel Delgado. Well, according to the DVDs that I have, they mentioned how Will O'Brien had found him working at a grocery store, but he done so much great stuff within like the arts and crafts and all that that um, Willis O'Brien convinced him to work with him on on the film The Lost World and that's how Marcel Degado eventually came to King Kong and all that so yeah I also really like the acting within the film and all that I really like its writing as well the writing is actually somewhat autobiographical but some similar in a way where basically uh, some things were based on what Mary St. Cooper was actually doing all that because uh, Mary St. Cooper made like not nature films per se he made movies around the jungle area and environment and all that he basically made movies like that like Chang and I think there was a second movie you know where basically he would like just have the camera very close up to the animals and all that like there's one shot of this movie I forgot that was featured in the documentary where basically Mary C. Cooper, or uh, there was this shot where from one of his films where you see a tiger just come up to the camera and all that, like try to jump towards a tree. He, in the DVD, the narrator points how uh, how like zoom lenses, like lenses that you could zoom in, haven't been invented yet at that time. So basically, Mary uh, actual tiger was literally up against the camera and all. So yeah, pretty interesting and all. Uh, basically, it's like somewhere around the character Carl Odom, at least being similar to Marion C. Cooper. To be honest, I don't see that much problems with the, the film itself. I do really like its pacing itself and how it builds up to like Kong when he's like revealed. The animation is pretty great. So yeah, I really enjoy like this film and all that and I would highly recommend. Stop motion does take a long time to make and all that. Which when you watch King Kong, it's pretty impressive how they did it. The most famous thing out of this movie is actually the... He, it was actually the when Kong fights the T-Rex and all that yeah that was it was really great and all you just see like all these elements coming together you got live action footage of Fei Ray hey, up against the log and all that you got King Kong and the T-Rex fighting and when Kong pushes over the log you just see it just coming down and all that yeah the elements like that like sort of mixed with each other which is really impressive this film has been so influential throughout like the decades of filmmakers and the filmmakers and like writers that came afterwards. To name a few is being like Ray Harryhausen who saw this film in theaters back in 1933 and all that. Later becoming a Samoshi animator and all that and actually his first job was uh, as one of the films by Ernest by Mercy Cooper and Ernest Lee Shostak and Willis O'Brien being the Mi Mighty Joe Young which actually came after or like the two Kong movies, Kong, Kong, King Kong and Son of Kong. So we'll also go work on the Clash of the Titans, the, se the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, also what I have here, 20 Million Miles to Earth, and uh, It Came from Beneath the Sea. As a side note, where House Harry Housen worked was supposed to work on two film projects uh, during the 1950s and all that, which he wasn't really a part of due to the budget itself. Of on those film projects, one of them being the bit the beast with a million eyes. 
I saw basically it was work with which was basically a film worked on by Roger Corman. Basically, Roger Corman needed a monster in the movie because American International Pictures made advertising of this giant monster that was so big that it couldn't even fit in a poster and all that because it had so many eyes, you know. So basically, first he was talking to Porch J. Ackman like, oh, sh who should we get and all that? And they say, oh, Ray Harryhausen. But Harryhausen was a bit too expensive, mainly because stop motion takes it takes a lot of time. I mean, also money to actually do it and all. So Roger Corman was like, uh, no. Oh, so then he went to Paul Bladestill. Oh, well, Bladestill oh, was actually cheap enough to actually do it. Well, Roger Corman was thinking of paying him to 100 but Bladestill says no, so he had to d double it and all that. And Paul Bladestill will later work on several other B-movies with Roger Corman. One of them being It, The Terror From Beyond Space. That film itself has an interesting story and also I could go on about Paul Bleed so. But this is about King Kong, you know. In case, also we should give it, like thumbs up to the score by Max Strainer of how it actually fits within the movie itself. Open how um, great it is and all that. He just he, he goes da 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 bun dun 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 da da dun dun. You know what I'm saying? Like has the epic feeling to it. In case, also one thing to bring up before we move on to our next film is the film The Most Dangerous Game. This is directed by Ernest B. Shostak and through and produced by Mary C. Cooper this time. Actually, I don't know who's the writer of the film. I forgot who it was, but basically this was based on the, I think a book or a story, but it's basically based on like some writing with the same title and all that. And I actually watched this film um, before I actually did this video and all that in order to actually see, huh, I wonder how this film goes aside with King Kong. Because with King Kong and The Most Dangerous Game, while well, this was being made, they were also finishing up The Most Dangerous Game and all that because they had a budget of Six hundred thousand dollars for King Kong, but I think I heard it was like, like a double, like a two film budget and all that. In case, so basically they were doing the most dangerous game, and and they actually the film King Kong reuses some sets from the movie from this movie, so mainly some jungle sets they put in the studio and all. And I was watching, I was like, ah, oh, it looks interesting and all that. Like, just watching the film, also, well, not just before King Kong, also because I'm very curious because this was on the Criterion Collection, so this film seems to be pretty important, and if you get what I'm saying. In any case, but I was watching the film, then one scene popped up, which is literally where basically we have our two main characters. Faye Ray also appears in this movie as well. Also, Robert Armstrong, who plays Carl Denham in King Kong, also appears in this movie as a like a small character role and all that. Not really like a major role, but like a small character role, role playing as the character of I forgot what's this character name. That's the thing. But in any case. But in this thing where basically both our main characters are running through the jungle and all that and they stumble upon a log and they cross over the ledge I was like oh my gosh there's the log there's the log Well you don't know what I'm talking about in the, there's a jungle scene within King Kong from 1933 Where basically the characters are trying are running away from like a giant like monster from the lake if they were crossing or I think you just call it a swamp so they're like running from that giant dinosaur there, uh, but when they stumble upon the log, King Kong is like the other is in the other side of it. Basically, it's like the like these two ledges like going deep down on and all that, and the log is just in the middle. But while they're crossing, and King Kong just comes by, so they were trying to cross us back, back and all that. And King Kong just grabs the log, moves it, and throws it down the ledge and all that. Uh, basically, in the most dangerous game. That log appears again. Thankfully, not Kongu like throws it off the edge, edge. But the log appears. It's like the same shot. Like they position the same shot and it looks like some of the same. I was like, wow, there, there's the actual log. I was like, so like starstruck. I was like, wow, there it is. But the most dangerous game is actually a really good movie. I actually highly suggest to watch it. Not just because it's King Kong related. Also, one thing to bring up about the 1933. King Kong movies. It's 
infamous deleted scenes, but basically one of them being the famous lost spider pit scene. Basically, it's the scene I brought up before where basically it's the ledge, where basically all the characters fall off the ledge, but um, a few of them manage to survive that very high fall, the bottom pit of it, and after me like giant spiders and giant like crab monsters and all that, like these strange looking monsters they have to deal with and all the characters stop. The reason why it was cut out wasn't because of the 1938 re-edits, it was mainly because Mary C. Cooper wrote this down was that it stops the story. Actually, you know, it's funny while the Wikizilla a video of Lost and Unreleased Kaiju Media and they bring up the spider pit scene and they bring up a rumor of how basically they had a screener for it and the audience was so shocked they ran out of the theater which end up being false because the note of course says it stopped the story and all that. Basically they want to keep a good pace in the film and they, they want like a spider pit scene to stop it. So they cut it out and many people point out even in the documentary that possibly speaking they actually Marisine Cooper most likely would have burned the footage because he wasn't even wasn't going to use it and all that. He was possibly going to burn the footage and all. And one of the interesting things is that Peter Jackson, who actually recreated a spider pit scene, is actually including the DVD bonus features and all that. Let me just pull this here. Yeah, it's included on the second disc here. There, but basically he points out how back, uh, back in the, when he was younger at the time, he heard rumors out and about about the spider pit scene where basically he, how the scene managed to like go from the U.S. to some other foreign country and all where it lies there in an archive. I forgot what the exact quote like, for, he says like 40 years later we're still talking about but we hadn't seen it yet. So yeah, it's actually pretty interesting to get that perspective of, like even though people really want this scene, there's a 9 out of 10 chance that we'll never see it. Mainly because, A, unless somebody copy it to like modern film stock, depending how it's archived, those film reels are currently degrading because nobody had checked on it or it's in poor condition and because of like the way it was stored and all. So yeah, that's interesting to know about. There's also several deleted snippets here and there and all that. Like, for example, the log scene I mentioned where basically you might be asking, huh, why didn't like go the other way and all that? Well, mainly because the, uh, there's like photographs and photos of like another giant, like like another dinosaur across from the log, so they couldn't like escape through there. In the like uh, recreation of the spider pit scene, they actually recreated several shots in order to actually build up that spider pit scene itself. Oh, they actually did some stop motion animation while using some, not really some modern techniques, they do use some blue screen and all that, but uh, mainly it was try to stay faithful to it, even degrading the footage itself. But Peter Jackson never actually put it into the King Kong movie itself, mainly because he says, oh, it's going to just be as a bonus feature, as his own thing. Because usually with King Kong, you don't really touch, touch the film itself. You're not like making a special edition of it, like special edition, the fan recreation. Like there's some other shots like missing here and there and all that. One of them being, which is actually, I don't think it's somewhat famous, famous, but it's notable in the great finale where basically we have King Kong up in the Empire State Building, and then getting shot by biplanes and he falls down. You just see him like boink 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 on the building until actually he starts slowly falling down and hitting in the ground. There's actually one shot, which is a photograph where you see King Kong like falling down from the building and you just see in the background the actual streets themselves and all that. I would say again, this movie has gotten very influential it's from Ray Harryhausen, Ishiro Honda, A.G. Superaya, uh, Ray Bradbury, hey, James Rowe, Peter Jackson, several other filmmakers out there who've probably seen this movie and all that are like, you know, the, this is great, you know. That ends our talk for the first film of King Kong. Now we're going to talk about its sequel, Son of Kong, from 1933 of December. So basically, here's what happens when it came to like making this movie. So basically, after the great like opening success to King Kong, where it was like a big box office hit and the critics loved it and all that, I think a few weeks afterwards, like basically, Mary C. Cooper was approached by RKO to make a sequel to the film, and also Mary C. Cooper was also thinking of making a sequel to the film itself. But RKO was like, "All right, you could do your sequel, but here's the thing: we want it for the holidays." So you gotta finish it within 10 months. 
I'm saying that we're going to cut half of the budget you had because of course the budget I mentioned was six hundred thousand dollars but now it's like three hundred thousand yeah it basically after they're like done with all that they only had nine months so to finish the movie nine months actually to finish the movie and all that so basically here's how the story goes so Carl them is being sued by everybody everybody basically of uh, what kind of damages that Kong had did uh, throughout the city of New York and all that but he managed to escape but the, the captain actually took him and over there to Kong Skull Island and they actually managed to escape in New York in order to work I forgot where did they escape to that's the thing but they escaped to somewhere else and started working like loading around cargo and all that but they actually managed to meet at a bar or by the guy actually gave the map to Carl Denham and all that uh, and he actually and he tells them that there's actually hidden treasure within like Skull Island itself oh so they go alright let's uh, holly jolly over there to Skull Island when, but when they arrive at Skull Island and all that, the guy actually like basically gave them the map, actually portrays them and kicks them off the boat, like a much more smaller boat. But then the crew turns on them, and so now the guy who gave them the map app is actually now with them, and now they're going to Skull Island to find the golden treasure. When they arrive there, they meet the son of Kong, who... I think the name, I forgot what's the name of the son of Kong, I think the fans gave him a name, but I forgot. Now the son of Kong have to protect them from the dinosaurs and also the other monsters who are over there in the island. To be honest, I shouldn't call them monsters, I should just call them dinosaurs. Because that's literally all it is. There's just dinosaurs and all that. No like fictional make-believe monsters except for the giant spiders down there in the giant pit. So yeah, that's the basic plot of the, the film itself. I would say it's good. But not good as the original. It's like a good sequel in a way, but it's not really in a good movie in a way. The movie is like a, basically runs like a short has a shorter runtime than King Kong, being an hour or in a few minutes instead of the hour and forty minutes and all that. And basically, it does have the comedic elements within the film, which some are pretty funny. The stop motion could have been improved in a way because, of course, you can actually see it being somewhat rushed. Of course, Willis O'Brien and Marcel the God come back. Uh, not the entire cast, of course. Of course, Robert Armstrong comes back. Uh, and one the actually an like, ironic scene in where basically hey, there's basically Carl Dunham and the captain decide will arrive at the place. I think it's just some other is I think it's just another foreign country and all that. But they arrive at the place and what arrive at a little like show and all that, like this like like basically they set up this place and this like tent and they're playing like show and all. Uh, and basically they go in there and basically you see a whole bunch of monkeys. Pretty funny because first you saw a giant ape, now you see like regular monkeys doing funny things, you know. But a woman comes up who actually is one of the main characters in the film. Um, she comes up and starts singing and all that. And the song kind of goes like this. as I feel like running away. Or basically the song is about running away and all that. Uh, I forgot if it's called Two Runaways or just I just feel like running away and all that. And then basically it's ironic in a way because we just saw Carl Dunham and the captain ran away from New York so they wouldn't get sued and charged. It was pretty funny and all. So yeah, there isn't that much to talk about this film because hey, it's not really that notoriety. But it's actually pretty impressive how they managed to finish up within the holiday season in December. Which wasn't as successful as the first King Kong movie to be honest. And they were actually planning to make a third film, mainly from Mary C. Cooper's idea, or basically called The New Adventures of King Kong. Or basically their idea was like, huh, how did they take King Kong from Skull Island to New York? And their idea was uh, basically is film like make an in-betweener. You see them like leave Skull Island with Kong, like they put them in the boat and all that, but while they arrive there, you see like Kong ends up escaping and some more or giant dinosaurs come up and now Kong is on the loose protecting them from the dinosaurs and all. In any case, but they decided to cancel that. Yes, here's the actual movie. There's not even bonus features here, it only has the trailer. But I suggest to listen to the audio commentary from Big Jack Films, which I'll actually leave in the description and all that. Well, but he also mentioned he doesn't even have much to say about this film. But, but he does point out how basically the print they use for the DVD, it looks to be a bit green. It's in black and white of course, but sometimes there's like this green tint to it. When I, which when I was watching the film, I did notice that green tint sometimes appearing up and up and on the film and all that. So yeah, that is 
Son of a Kong. But before we move on, uh, one honorable mention to make like during the 1930s. Meanwhile in Japan, and where King Kong was released in September 1933, in Japanese theaters of course, of course at then, it was like a big success of course and critically pay praise. But the distribution company of the of the Japanese Japanese release for King Kong also made their own Kong movie, which will be considered as the start of the King Kong knockoff movies. In other words, how Big Jack's films will put it, the Kong exploitation films and all that. The film I'm talking about they made was Wasei King Kong or Kingu Kongu, but many people would say call it with its in common English title Japanese King Kong. But through my research and all that, I recently researched the film back in last year in 2020 from as an English class assignment, where basically I talk about the evolution of King Kong and all that, and also what changed throughout, throughout the course of the films, and also I mentioned how, why they were made and all that. The final essay being 22 pages with more than 20 sources and also over 9,000 in words. It was a pretty long essay for high schoolers there. The minimum was five, but for some reason I decided to write a 22 page epic about King Kong the Giant Ape. I ended up getting an A. In case, but basically, I did this through Google Translate, which is not entirely accurate to be honest, but it did give me like a beneficial idea because here's the thing here's my notes and all that. Many people like call it Japanese King Kong. So I actually did this where I translate King Kong and Japanese. If you look at the poster, there's about two boxes. One of them have like the, the ja this text here, which is supposed to be Japanese. While the other box had King Kong, Kingu Kongu to King Kong. I then translated the Wasei A and the Japanese text came like this. And basically it's the same in like kanji in the poster. So we'll say translate to made in Japanese. So the actual title should be made in Japanese King Kong. Or the movie's just called King Kong and made in Japanese was just a tagline. Like for example, you, when you watch the movie, when you look at the Akira poster, you don't go Neo Tokyo is about to explode Akira. That's not the full title of the movie. So yeah, that's one thing to point out about the uh, title is so yeah, I'm not sure if people know about it, or do you just say, you know what, we're going to just go with a simple translation of Japanese King Kong. In case, but I did took a, I think I just took a literal translation of it, instead of like taking the other route, in a way. Like there's these two friends who make a living by picking coins up the floor and all that, one of them is in a relationship, but he wants to get married with his girlfriend, but in order to do his pro father that he's wealthy and all that, he goes to the movie theater in Tokyo to watch King Kong, and he, and he decides, you know what, I'm going to capitalize on it. So he decides to make a stage play adapta adaptation of King Kong. I don't know what happens in the ending of the movie, actually I don't think nobody knows what happens to the ending of the movie itself. The film came out on October 5th of 1933, and I forgot it was a, if it was a... So the film was an unauthorized Japan was an unauthorized uh, Japanese silent comedy of the version of King Kong, but the thing is, they didn't really directly took the plot of King Kong. It just sort of made a comedy out of him. I forgot what's the runtime. I think it was like around 30 minutes or so, but it was like some low runtime like that. And the film premiered on October of 1933, which I couldn't believe when I read that information because the Japanese release was, of course, in September. So that means they had to do within less than 30 days or less than a month since the film came out and all that. Like, they had to, like, come up with a story, gather all these ideas and all that, you know. You get what I'm saying? And later in 1938, when, who, as a, to capitalize Kong again, this time for his 1938 re-release, he's both in the U.S. and Japan, of course, and their company decided to capitalize on Kong, and they make King Kong appears in Edo. Well, many people are confused about this film, but nobody knows a direct correct answer to this, was that the film could have been considered the first recorded g giant monster Japanese film um, because in the promotional images King Kong appears as like a giant monster you know he's like hopping around across the build across the houses of course but in other prolific shots you see him human size and in another one where he just stands a around a girl like this you do see him like human size being slightly taller but I should point out the actual truth 
first like Japanese giant monster movie where basically there was like this giant monster and all that. It's not really a giant monster if you think about it, but basically it's like the start of the kaiju genre was the Great Buddha Revival of 1934 or where basically a giant Buddha statue walks around Japan and all that. There's only like a few like a few stills here and there and all that like a few promotional stills or somewhere around the lines and all and also some like advertisements so yeah but King Kong appears in the Edo it was separated in two parts so yeah it's like next week you, like you first watch the first part then the next week afterwards you have to watch the second part to the uh, conclusion of the movie itself unfortunately all three of these films are lost in time but nobody knows how but many people point out because uh, at this time in late 30s and also beginning in the 1940s World War II was starting to happen and many people point out that probably because of Allied bombings or Hiroshima or Nagasaki the both all three of these films were destroyed. To be honest I just come to the conclusion that the King Kong films or the prints were somewhere stored around Hiroshima and Nagasaki. With say King Kong only has two photo stills. The Great Buddha Rival has a few of them and also a few advertisements including with say King Kong. But also King Kong appears in Edo also has the same thing. But nobody can find these movies, and it's like a least likely chance we can actually like find these movies themselves, you know. So basically, people are confused because of the publicity films having a human size and also a giant size. Even the special effects, the guy who actually made a suit who later will work on the Godzilla films. I forgot his name, but he brought up an interview like it was a giant ape. So possibly it could be the second giant monster movie or it could just be like some human sized King Kong character uh, going around like a Sasquatch. Now we move on to the 1960s. Willis O'Brien, here's what Willis O'Brien has been doing. He unfortunately has now, in order to bring up back his career and all that, uh, he decides to write down the outline to King Kong vs Frankenstein. Well unfortunately most American studios said no. So his partner John Beck, a also a producer who actually took interest interest with uh, with this film, then Toho, the company uh, who of course are famous for making several Kurosawa films and also oh the Godzilla films at the time, which Toho was interested within the script and all that. But the only thing was like they are like you know what? this Frankenstein thing we're going to change it to Godzilla, and they hired the writer Shinichi Sekizawa in order to actually change that and all that. So basically they changed it to King Kong vs Godzilla at this time and they got the director of course Shiro Hondo directed the first Godzilla film who also directed several sci-fi films throughout this is like period of time from 1955 to like the 60s there. He directed the Mysterions, Verin the Unbelievable, Rodan. So yeah we got Shiro Hondo directing in King Kong vs Godzilla which I own on VHS here from Good Times Video. This is the US version, but I do own the Japanese version of the film itself, which is on Blu-ray. Yeah, this is from the Criterion Collection and all. And this is actually the first time that officially through the Criterion Collection that basically they managed to get King Kong, the Japanese version, in the United States because before and Universal only had like like basically released the US version on DVD and, and Blu-ray, but and also through VHS tapes, but not really see Japanese version of the film. So basically, the story revolves around um, basically this ad agent who wants to boost ratings for his t for the TV station and all that. They travel to Faroe Island because they heard that there's there's like a mysterious god they're praising over there. But they manage to find King Kong. Meanwhile, Godzilla arises from being frozen throughout all these years since Godzilla rides again, of course. And both of them are heading towards Japan. And which then eventually, if they eventually fight each other throughout the but the movie is really great. I did really like it. I did really like its comedy and all that. You actually see some comedic levels done through Shinichi Sekizawa in a way, you know, make it more, a bit more fun and all that. Which Shiro Honda didn't really like. Not the comedy aspect, but more in the, the comedy within the monsters themselves. Basically, like instead of having animal animalistic fights like the last film Godzilla vs. Again where Godzilla fights off Ingress, they had like pro wrestling fights, you know, throwing people over, s spinning them around and all that, punching each other and all. So yeah, Shiro Honda didn't really like that, but he couldn't really fight back the studio when doing it and all. 
I also really like its soundtrack, which is done by Kira Fukube, who also done several other uh, films as well, and is famous composer around the Godzilla community and all that, being recognized for his, like the song and music he had done. And the suit acting with this film is pretty great, hey, in a way. Hey, the it's, you know, Godzilla is portrayed by portrayed by Shiro Honda and also portrayed by I uh, Suichi Horose, not for Godzilla and all that, but it was portrayed. But Suichi Horose portrayed a King Kong. But in case. So yeah, I really enjoyed this film and all that, and I really hope that the new remake Godzilla vs Kong can actually live up to this film and all. Now I'm going to talk about the US version of the- I'm going to leave a link to the description for a detailed video of what the King Kong movie changes and all that, both the US and Japanese version. Toho actually released a film in the United States in Honolulu, Hawaii, like in the Japanese language with English subtitles and all that. Which is interesting in a way that I wonder why Honolulu, Hawaii, or Hawaii in fact will actually he released like Japanese films without with English subtitles and not dubbing them over. I think it's just something I don't know about Hawaii and looked in the aspect. Maybe there's like a good, good population of Japanese people over there that I don't know about. John Beck throughout this deal actually managed to like get the rights for the international distribution of the film in the US, Canada and also two other countries. He then sold the rights to Universal and all of that but before they had to like show the movie they had to of course give it an English dub. Uh, so they gave it an English dub, rewrote the film, add new American scenes, then finally releasing it in 1963, which also became a great successful. And King Kong actually has the record for the most attended Godzilla film. I'm not sure it just implies all Godzilla films, like including the U.S. Godzilla films, or like the most attended Japanese Godzilla film, film ever made, because they had like 12, over 12 million tickets sold. But not all people were successful. Uh, throughout all this, since the beginning of the deal, since the release of the film, Willis O'Brien never found that King Kong vs. Frankenstein actually got picked up, then changed to King Kong vs. Godzilla. Never really found, it, found out. According to the history video from Big Action Bill, oh, which I will actually leave in the description and all that, which is a great history video by the way, but it does leave some spoilers, so I suggest to watch the film before, beforehand. beforehand. So I suggest to watch the documentary beforehand. But basically, Willis O'Brien will make daily, will make like some like consistent phone calls to John Beck, like, "Hey, is it picked up by any studio?" And Willis O'Brien eventually did find out that King Kong on the project they got picked up, but changed into King Kong vs. Godzilla, and was actually planning to actually sue John Beck because he was never informed about this deal or never was re involved throughout this, the course of the making of the film and all of them. Yeah, he did file a loss. He did file a lawsuit, but he couldn't actually. But he didn't have money to actually have it consistently going and all of that. He eventually died from a heart attack later in that year of 1962. And his wife had said it later on in interviews or such and such when asked about this, where basically she points out that part uh, because the King Kong versus Frankenstein on project put a lot of stress into Willis O'Brien himself. And many people say like. Man, it would have been really great to have Willis O'Brien and with A.G. Superaya, uh both working together in for King Kong vs. Godzilla. The reason why they don't go like this is because A.G. Superaya was inspired from the movie King Kong to actually start working on the effects and all that when he saw it in Japanese theaters in 1933. To the point that he actually owned his own personal print of But I think one thing the people forgot to bring up is that A.G. Superai doesn't learn, doesn't know English, and Willis O'Brien doesn't know Japanese. Plus, I think that Willis O'Brien might have said no of being involved like the, within the production of the film. I think he will be involved in a way, but I don't really see it in a way that much because the thing is about him is that part of Willis O'Brien will say no, like Japan. Ah, oh, that's too far, you know. I have to, I have to. I don't even know Japanese. And probably they might have two different ideas of what they really want with this uh, with this film and all that. Because Willis O'Brien mainly worked on stop motion, while A.G. Superior worked on, on suitmation. 
both of our different mediums because with Zoomation you could just film live action footage and all that. With stop motion you have to take you have to take frame by frame and all that and actually really think about where you have to actually put the care where to actually put the models and how to move them and all. It wouldn't work well if Willis O'Brien would have worked on King Kong vs. Godzilla. Party will straight out refuse like no, we're going to have Frankenstein, you know. We ain't going to have the, your giant lizard attack at this attack Kong, you know. So we move on. The next film we're going to talk about is King Kong Escapes from 1967. And this is also directed by Ishiro Honda. Uh, the, the My DVD basically has one of these, these things, like the locks for some reason. But the thing is, when I bought it, I bought it used for my favorite movie story. And when you open them, it kind of like, oh, when you like, but uh, when you slowly open them, yeah, it starts with here. But you can literally just open it like this because the other hinge is broken. So yeah, I only have the DVD copy of them. So basically, at this time, Toho already had the license and rights to King Kong for like a few years to use and all that. And also, at this time, Rick and Bass also had some deals with around Japan and all that because some animation for the Rick and Bass specials were done in Japan and all. Uh, but Rick and Bass approached Toho oh, about making a movie about their about the show they had, the King Kong show, which came out in 1966. So basically, Rick and Bass like go, "Hey, you could guys, can you make a movie based on our show, the King Kong show?" Which the animation was done by Toei, who will later be popular for their several Japanese anime series like Mazinga Z, the Dragon Ball series, One Piece, and other shows and all that. that I forgot their names. Also, Sailor Moon. And in any case. So Toho was like, sure, okay, they already presented them like an idea of what they had. It would have been about these people going to this island and all that, and Kong finding up finding a giant monster, giant sea monster known as Ebera. Rick and Bass said no, like, no, that won't be a good idea. Mainly because it like it doesn't fit well with the King Kong show and all that. They're like, oh, okay, let's work on their plot, and they work on King Kong Escapes. The plot for the Cancel Kong project where Kong fights Ebera was later changed in order to incorporate Godzilla in Kong's Kong's in Kong's absence and all that. So in case now we came to 1960s. The story is basically about these people exploring the island and all that where they actually managed to meet Kong but they decided to leave afterwards and they work for the United Nations of course. So we got an international cast, you know, some Japanese and some Americans of course. Of course. So they just leave there but and basically talk about the discovery of Kong. Meanwhile, the evil Doctor Who, not related to Doctor Who, the BBC series airing in, airing at the time, but the evil Doctor Who well, was like, you know, I need this uh, element called planet. Meanwhile, Doctor Who, not related to the BBC series, is working with Madame X in order to get the certain element in the Antarctica and all that, or somewhere, yeah, in the Antarctica and all. Basically, they made a a like a giant robot ape for some reason. They're like, oh, this ape uh, doesn't work uh, there. Let's let's capture Kong. So they go over to the island to Faroe Island and capture King Kong over there in order to transport him to Antarctica. So then we come to Tokyo where King Kong and also Mechanic Kong both escape. Uh, both them are them are fighting each other and all that. So yeah, that's the basic plot of the film. The way I describe it was a bit odd. But the movie was pretty good, I would say. I did really like its characters, its story. The concept was pretty interesting. The summation was also pretty great as well. And the Kong suit is like a great improvement from the original King Kong, from the 1962 version of King Kong. Um, mainly because the 1962 version Kong suit has been criticized by fans of the worst looking King Kong there ever was. Mainly because Zarkio put some restrictions on them, like, look, you could do King Kong, but you don't, you can use the same design we did for the 1933 version. So they added like reference from a, another Jap, I think it's like another monkey they did. And so the, in order to like incorporate a different type of face, but now this one looks a bit more better, but still look a bit cheap in a way. Not cheap in a way, like like sort of like a. Halloween costume type in a way. I did really enjoy it and all that. And Linda Miller, actually, funny enough, this is like. The, uh, there's like two films that she worked on, or like several other films, I forgot. Uh, but who actually plays the the character, actually plays in the film, like she's like right, right here and all that, as one of the main characters. Forgot what's her actual name in this film, that's the thing. Throughout the interview, she mentions like several stories revolving around King Kong escapes and all that. Uh, but one of the funniest things 
she mentioned both versions, like in the US version and the Japanese version and all that. She was dubbed over her from the films and all. And also the Blu-ray and all that does not have the Japanese version. It only has the English, the US version of the film. Um, so, yeah, at least it was in, it's in widescreen, of course. This is like the same thing with the King Kong Blu-ray. The King Kong vs. Godzilla films where basically they don't have the, they don't have any bonus features, only the films by themselves. Not even like a trailer or some promotion. Probably if classic media would have gotten the rights to King Kong vs. Godzilla or King Kong Escapes, probably they would have like put some effort within giving it bonus features and all that. So, yeah. So we're done with that. Now we're going to talk about how the three other films. So let's go with them. Next is King Kong, the remake from 1976. So basically, let's put in the time frame here. In the 70s, he's in 1975, a year before the movie Jaws uh, came out in theaters. It had a uh, trouble production and it was being delayed several times, mainly because of the shark prop they had. It didn't really work well. Oh, and also filming in the ocean was a bit of a hassle for Steven Spielberg. But he became one of the biggest successes at the at that time. I'm in the box office and all that, and obviously giving the term blockbuster. Or basically being the first blockbuster, or, and, or mainly because people were just lining up around the blocks and all that in order to actually watch this movie of Jaws and all that. Basically, Dino De Laurentiis saw this and says like, Oh, well, I'm going to make the next blockbuster. Who should I get? Uh, King Kong. I'm going to get King Kong. Let's remake King Kong. So basically, Dino De Laurentiis, well, Universal could also make their movie and all that. For the remake, they modernized everything to, instead of taking place in the 1930s, they set it to like present time in the 70s and all that. And they actually changed the story to somewhat differently. Instead of a filmmaker deciding to make a movie in the jungle, they set the story to a guy who actually owns a oil company. So basically, they have like a company executive and all that, uh, found finding out and thinking that there's this island that might ha have oil in it. So they decide to travel there in order to actually gain oil and to make money. But they arrive there, they actually find that there was actually villagers who lived there at the time, and they actually took samples of the oil they have. But the villagers also captured a girl and named Duan and all that. They capture her and then she is sacrificed to King Kong. But meanwhile, while several crew members go to save, go to save Duan and all that, uh, they take a sample of the oil and realize, hey uh, man, we gotta wait like a few more centuries and all that because this oil isn't ready to actually t he take from. Um, so basically, they're like, you know what? Instead of taking oil, what if we took something else? What if we took Kong? So yeah, that's what they did. The film falls differently from the King Kong movie itself of 1933. James Rowe has said that it felt as a remake, but it's a pretty good film on its own. Which I do agree with him, it's actually a really good film. I did really like the story and the new ways how they did it and all that. This time, of course, they done it through Sumation with the help of Rick Baker. Funny enough, if you were supposed to work on the, uh, according to, according to Big Jack Films, he was supposed to work on the movie Ape. But basically, Ape is another King Kong ripoff. But he was offered to like go work on that that movie. But he said, uh, no. Oh, and he decided to work on King Kong. Pretty good choice there, Rick Baker. So basically, he worked on his suit. But one of the things they brought up is that, what if we had King Kong to be more of a human-like character? Or basically, instead of having him like a, like a giant ape and all that, they just have him like, you know, a bit human and all. Like a bit, like a, like, sort of like a mix between a human and an ape. And they're like, oh, that's a bad idea. Uh, so, Rick Breaker was assigned with a nurse suit maker to actually design the suit. And they end up setting on Rick Baker's design as a giant ape. You kind of see how now things are changed. Instead of relying on stop motion, which at the time was a pretty old technique, they're now relying on on Suitmation, similar to the Godzilla films and the uh, two other film, the two other Kong films that came by before. I would say the movie is actually really well done, on to be honest, and also the soundtrack was also pretty great as well. Oh, going like going dun dun, bun dun, dun, like something like that, like like this, like has like this epic tone to it as well. Oh, thank you.
So yeah, I would actually recommend to actually watch the, watch this remake and all that. It's a pretty good remake. It does make several changes and all that. For example, in the finals ending to the movie and all that, where instead of having King Kong being up like a, being like setting like in the stage and all that, you know, presenting opera, is presenting a theater. No, he's now advertising for oil. So yeah, a giant you get a giant ape to advertise oil and all that. Of course, it's the same thing. He makes an escape to New York, but instead of climbing the Empire State Building, which at the time in the 1930s was the tallest building, and was in New York. Now it was climbing the twin, the World Trade Center of the Twin Towers up there. Now he's like climbing up there and all that. Now he's like climbing up uh, on the. Now he's. Now he's climbing on the Twin Towers where he actually, there's this one cool scene where basically he jumps from one tower and then jumps from the other and grabs the ledge and then climbs up to the other tower itself. The Blu-ray copy I have is released through Studio Canal as you see here and all of them. And it's actually both Region A and Region and B which is pretty surprising because most of the Blu-rays is the King Kong, the 1976 version. No, at this because before 2021, we didn't have, uh, there was no Blu-ray release for King Kong on the 76 remake in the United States and all that. Uh, there's only been like through the UK, France, Japan and all that. I managed to get one at my favorite movie store, which is in pretty interesting. But the weird thing is uh, it's in the side here where it says Universal. I have no idea why they have the license here. To actually distribute the film. Look, it says copyright 2009. All rights is reserved. Dolby and the Dolby logo and trademarks and Dolby and all them. Pretty strange. Probably some distribution rights here and there and all that. In the U.S., there have only been like VHS, DVD, Laserdisc releases, but never the Blu-ray release. That was until last. I think earlier this year, Shout Factory announced that basically, like, hey, we're going to do like a King Kong Blu-ray and all that. And they're actually going to feature the TV cut of the film in the late 70s and the early 80s. I forgot what television station one, but they were like saying, Hey, we want to play King Kong in TV and all that, but it's a bit too short. Can you make it a bit longer to fit in a three hour time slot? So they actually did make it longer by including several deleted scenes and some extended scenes here and there and all that. And which lasts is like a much more longer than the original theatrical cut and all that. Only aired three times. One in, in the late 70s and two times in the 80s and all that. Like in the very early 80s and all that. Since then they've been spreading around through bootleg VHS tapes and also there's some film prints. But according to Big Trap Films, the film prints are probably from the VHS copies that have been spreading around uh, throughout this time. He actually has two of them. He actually has like uh, two copies of the TV cut itself and all that. Uh, Big Jack's films. Now they're actually officially releasing it on Blu-ray. Which, which to be honest, the uh, Blu-ray I have and also several other Blu-rays do have the, the deleted scenes, but not all of them, of course. Like there are some interesting aspects when they have the deleted scenes. Very interesting. Now, Shark Factory is now going to release this. But before we move on to the last two films we're going to talk about and all that that I actually saw, and I'm going to talk about the uh, Kong film that I hadn't seen yet because I couldn't track down a physical copy of it or like find it online, which is the Infamous. King Kong Lives from 1986. So basically, this is like 10 years later from 1976 now, uh, where basically the film was successful, but wasn't really critically praised that much. Mainly, it was filled with mixed opinions and all. For 10 years later, Dean Dorenzo is like, "Hey, I want to make a sequel to King Kong. I I think I know a reason why, but I forgot why he wanted to make a." A sequel now at this point in time like 10 years later and all that. So basically he did a sequel of course I and mean, basically it was like a direct sequel so the first like few minutes of the films are just a recap of what happened before in the 76 version and all that. And basically the plot of this time is a a bit of a strange one. So basically King Kong falls off from the Twin Towers and all that so now he has to be saved so they have to do a heart transplant and all that with an artificial part but Kong needs blood and all 
So they, while that, they actually managed to go back to the island and actually find a Lady Kong. That's how I'm going to call her and all that. Uh, so they captured the Lady Kong and they transferred to the other Kong and all. In order to successfully transplant the artificial heart to King Kong. So they managed to do that and all that for some reason. And then, but then, and King Kong was like, you know what, I'm going to escape from you guys. And he leaves with Lady Kong. Now people are on the hunt for both of them and all that. So that is the plot of the film itself. I have no opinion about it because I haven't seen it. But I hear a lot of opinions about from online. It's not a good movie from what I heard. Basically what comes around with the uh, plot and the characters and all that. Uh, and also several other aspects within the film itself. Being one of the bad King Kong movies like the Black Sheep out of uh, everybody else. And funny enough, there's a rumor by Joe Bob Briggs. I'm not sure if Joe Bob is correct about this. Joe Bob Briggs, if you don't know, is a famous is a horror film critic. He was also in a TV show called Monster Vision as a horror host there for a few years through TNT and all of that. But he mentioned when he played King Kong Escapes in Joe Bob's Last Drive-In and all that. He mentions how they approached Stephen King to actually write the script for King Kong Lives and all that. Uh, but Stephen King said no. I tried to actually find information about this, but I couldn't find much, or not, or neither at all, because I'm not sure if to, I'm not sure if Joe Bob Briggs is just saying like a rumor and all that, uh, or like a repeating a rumor, or he's actually like just made up something to make fun of the movie itself. I don't know. Somebody should really ask him. It's like an interesting rumor and all that. The I couldn't. The reason I couldn't find a physical copy, the reason why is because the movie is literally out of print. The only copies you can actually get are A, a DVD which sells like for like high prices on eBay and all that. Not too high to the point, but not so reasonable well, compared to paying a $20 Blu-ray. Actually, I paid this for $10, but you get what I'm saying. Basically, you can find it on VHS, DVD, or Laserdisc. The, actually, the Laserdisc release and the VHS release. I think they changed the title to King Kong. Kong 2, or just simply King Kong Lives and all that because that's the original title. But basically they changed the title to King Kong 2 but in the DVD they were like, uh, we switch it back to King Kong Lives. The ironic thing about King, the movie King Kong Lives is that King Kong didn't live till the end. But he did have a son. For some reason he did have a son. In any case, like was Lady Kong and all that. And according to the book, uh, basically I read this up from Wikipedia but it's like sources like a book basically through I'm trying to remember the company's name, but basically it was like the same company that made the He-Man cartoon. Like, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. I'm trying to remember the... I know it starts with the word fun, but I can't remember the rest of the name itself. But basically they mentioned how Dino De Laurentiis actually approached them um, to actually make a TV show about how like like the like the son of Kong on basically being a sequel to King Kong to King Kong Lives but it kind of got hot canceled and fell through and all that and there isn't that much information from that quote and all that I'm trying to remember the company and all that what's the company's name and but the information that this source is from a book that kind of mentions this and all that like some history book about the company itself or something about animation in case. But here's the kind of sad thing about King Kong Lives. When it was released in theaters in 1986, it wasn't successful. It was both critically panned and not really successful in the box office and all that. And it was John Gillerman's last film. John Gillerman did come back to direct of the film, but it was his last film when we actually done. And like the last film we actually directed and all that, he will, he will like later like just retire from directing and all. So yeah, kind of sad there to be honest. Like. Like, you, you, like, your last directing role was King Kong Lives, which nobody from my heard likes. So yeah, next one we're going to talk about is King Kong from 2005, directed by Peter Jackson. And okay, it's got this field book here. I think I got it for like $5 at Big Lots. For some reason, Big Lots sells movies. Yeah, it's like this strange thing I've seen in recent times where basically now stores are like so that stores are not usually like usually sells movies now are selling movies like big lots dollar general dollar tree he what else uh, to get your local gas station for some reason sells dvds 
Thank you. This is another remake of the original version, but this time actually taking place in the 1930s, in the 1930s and all of that, unlike the 76 remake. It's basically the same plot as King Kong. It's literally just the same plots, but only like a few differences like picked up here and there and all that. Uh, it's a pretty good remake, I would say, and it's actually really great. It's actually pretty good and all that. The film runs around three hours, which kind of runs a bit long and all that. Like, wasn't really necessary to be like a three hour epic and all that. But in case, but basically the film was also pretty good and well done as well. The CGI is actually pretty impressive and also some of its practical effects. There were very few but so they were actually pretty good as well. The acting the acting is well done. Overall it's a pretty good remake. Put in the time frame of why this film came about was that in the 90s where basically Peter Jackson was directing the movie The Frighteners at the time, Universal was seeing the dailies in the film like, ah, Peter Jackson, he has something to him, you know. And so they approached Peter Jackson of remaking two mo of two of he could like remake one movie, but they have like two options for him to like actually direct. He could direct A, a remake of King Kong, or B, a remake of The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Peter Jackson was like, you know, I'm going to do King Kong. And they actually have everything ready. Like, not everything ready, but mostly everything ready. They were actually, they had like, they were setting up a cast, they were already making some of the effects for the film, they were making some of the miniatures, they were already designing some art pieces here and there, some storyboards, they completed a script, and they were already like casting the film itself. The only problem was that this was late 90s already, and it was 1998 world around, and two films come out, Godzilla 1998, and Mighty Joe Young, Disney's remake of the, of course, the 1940s Mighty Joe Young. Universal was like, you know, we're going to cancel this film because we don't want to be like the third wheel. Oh, we don't want to like, be like the third place compared to these, these two other giant monster movies and all that. So well, after that, uh, Peter Jackson left Universal to work on new, to work with New Line Pictures to direct the Lord of the Rings in his trilogy, which eventually, which became like pretty successful at the time, winning over. And I think I forgot what film won uh, like a few Oscars and all that. In case, and so Universal approached him and approached Peter Jackson again, like, "Hey, you want to do like a the, the Kong remake again?" He goes, "Oh, sure thing. Well, I'm going to do the Kong remake." And they made this film. Well, Peter Jackson mentioned the audio commentary for the director's cut of King Kong. The extended version was that they were actually having thinking of having a cameo with Fay Ray, which was also another idea for the King Kong 1976 remake, where they had a cameo, where they had actually planned a cameo for for Fay Ray. But the thing is, for the 1976 remake, they couldn't actually manage. They couldn't actually. Fay Ray didn't really want to do it and all that, or. Uh, but Forrest J. Ackerman did make a cameo in King Kong, but I think it's pretty hard where to spot him and all that. They also were planning to actually do a cameo appearance for Fay Ray for the night that would have been the like the 90s remake and all of that. Or basically, when King Kong falls off the Empire State Building, she'll actually say the line, "It was beauty that killed the beast" and all that, which was said by Art Robert Armstrong in playing as Carl Dem in the original film and all of that. It would have been a great tribute to be honest. It would have a great tribute to actually have Fay Ray a, to actually say it was beauty that killed the beast. But before they started filming and all that, like a month before, like a few months before, Fay Ray actually passed away and all and they couldn't actually do the cameo. To be honest, it would have been great to actually have that tribute there to actually have a, one of the actors from the original film to actually say a, that line itself. Speaking of cameos, what if Linda Miller made a cameo in Godzilla vs. Kong? Huh, that would be interesting. In case, but overall, it's a pretty great remake. I would re definitely recommend it and all that. Uh, I have the Blu-ray Steelbook here, as I already mentioned. Unfortunately, it doesn't have much bonus features for this one. Here's the Blu-ray and here's the DVD. I watched the extended version as well. To be honest, the extended version does have some interesting scenes, but it does have the swamp scene and all that. Uh, where obviously the guys are attacked by like quirky creatures there in Skull Island. It was a good thing that Peter Jackson cut those things because they didn't really add much to the story itself. In any case. In case, now we move on to our next film and all that. Which will be the most recent Kong film until, Godz until Godzilla, Godzilla vs. Kong comes out. Skull Kong Skull Island from Legendary Pictures and Warner Brothers. In case, 
So this is not really a remake with of King Kong. It's more like a film with his King Kong and all that. But basically, the story takes place in the Vietnam War. There, where basically they're going to inv invest and explore an island called Skull Island and all that, where they might have some creatures over there. When they travel, they're like going, do, 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 we're traveling to Skull Island. There they end up finding King Kong, which at this film is basically giant size, basically similar to Godzilla and all that. So they find King Kong and all that, and they end, they end up attacking the military and all, all who went there, and now the groups are split into two. They have to find each other. The only problem is that one group wants to kill Kong, but Kong is there to actually protect the villagers who live at the island from the Skull Crawlers who are living at, in the actual island. This movie is actually really good. I really enjoyed its like its its action and all that. It's done with CGI, but I really like its action scenes. Its comedic parts were really well done. I did really like some of the effects in the film as well. The soundtrack was also pretty good. It was also some good song choices here and there and all that. There are some inter interesting references and tributes throughout this film and all that. Uh, mainly because the director mentioned that he actually took some inspiration from Japanese manga and also Neon Genesis Evangelion. Because you see Kong just running, running, fighting off the helicopters and all that. Uh, and you see just like the best action scenes. Things of Kong fighting the skull crawlers and also the way the, the camera moves, its cinematography. In any case, so yeah, those are some of the things he like points out throughout the he put in the film and all that. To be honest, it's a pretty good film as a standalone itself and all that. But an interesting thing about this film is that uh, it's, a, it's part of the MonsterVerse, as people will call it, basically from Legendary Pictures. They started with Godzilla 2014 and all that, then Kong Skull Island. So basically Kong Skull Island became, beforehand, became the prequel to Godzilla and all that. And Godzilla became its sequel and all. But then afterwards, they, but afterwards, I think before the release of Kong Skull Island, they announced that, oh, we're going to do a movie, we're going to do Godzilla vs. Kong and all that. We're going to do, ooh, like a remake of Godzilla vs. Kong. Which Toa expressed back in the 1960s actually do a part 2 of Godzilla vs. Kong and all that. But they're, they couldn't get the rights back, so they actually were planning to like do it back in the 90s. But it's rights problems. Now they could do it. Now they could now do Godzilla vs Kong yet again the second, and which will be a, the first time the film will actually be remade and all that. Unlike the original film, it's going to actually have like an actual, oh winner. So yeah, aside from that, oh Kong Skull Island is actually a pretty good film that stands on its own. It didn't really need to be a part of a series. It didn't really need to like, be a part of like. Like that, you know, it actually is a good film on its own in a way. You don't have to watch Godzilla 2014, you don't have to watch the other MonsterVerse films, which would be Godzilla King of the Monsters and also then Godzilla vs. Kong. It actually stands on its own, to be honest. Which I think the filmmakers are actually trying to do, actually try to have the film stand on its own. Because if you think about it, what if the MonsterVerse wasn't that successful? What if like Godzilla was like, oh, we did it, and Colin Scorline was like, oh, we didn't do it. In any case. So, yeah. And that is all the Kong movies that I talked about. We are now done. Now we get to Godzilla vs Kong, which I'm pretty excited to actually watch and all that. It premieres Wednesday, March 31st. There's and all that, not on a Friday for some reason. I think Friday is just April 2nd. Oh yeah, it also plays on HBO Max. So yeah, Godzilla vs Kong will be a great film to watch and all that. But an interesting thing is that the movie is supposed to come out but it was delayed several times. I'm one of the is because the overload was CG. It's going to be an interesting film to watch and all that. For me, what I think is going to who's going to win? I'm going to say Godzilla because I'm pretty biased. This is because I really like Godzilla, the Godzilla films themselves. I'm a God, I'm a more of a Godzilla fan than a King Kong fan. Unlike Big Jack films, he also says the thing he's like more of a Kong fan than a Godzilla fan. But everybody's point. <laughs> It's funny how people make arguments with this debate where basically everybody calls basically Godzilla, they point out like his strength, he beat King Ghidorah, which King Ghidorah is probably much more much more powerful than Godzilla than Kong or Godzilla combined. Uh, he beat he he beat King Ghidorah and all that. He has atomic breath, he has a tail oh that could probably hit things like Kong. But people who actually come up the base for Kong are like, oh, he's big monkey. Which, here's the thing, Kong is not a monkey. 
He's an ape. Monkeys have tails, not an apes don't. So yeah, that's one thing to point out about these these people on the street. Yeah, these people on the street, look at them. They're thinking Kong could win. No, Godzilla's gonna win. In case, but there's also several spoilers coming out of Godzilla vs. Kong. Like the director already even you know, already even said like yeah, there's some of them are true and all that. Like many people are saying like, oh Godzilla is not gonna be killed off and all that or or Kong's gonna be killed off. Oh, well, an interesting thing about the contract, like I heard this from the guy 3C Films, which is a great channel, by the way, who actually reviews, actually reviews and talks about movies and all that. He mainly, most of his videos mainly talks about the latest movie news out there and all that, like official sources and all, not rumors. Like, like he talks about, oh, they're filming this movie now, or oh, this movie has been announced, or or now this movie's going to get a release now with a trailer, or it has a trailer, man. He mentions that there's some part in the contract with, between Legendary and Toho where basically the contract states that you can't kill off Godzilla. So now people are saying like, oh, Godzilla's going to have a son. <laughs> Throughout this, he's going to have a son and all that that we never heard about. So we can actually still have, somewhat have Godzilla films and all. And the director is definitely saying like, oh, there's not going to be a tie with this, this movie. He's going to have one winner, Godzilla and or Kong. Who do you choose? I choose you, Pikachu. Blank case, but to be honest, I was I would definitely say Godzilla. But then again, this will only be the second Kong movie, and many people want like a third Kong movie. So we're like saying, oh, we're going to kill off Godzilla, so like have more Kong movies and all that. Or maybe he's in a fight to the death, mainly because, or maybe because like Kong Kong comes out as winner and Godzilla just like walks away, like bye guys. In case. And Godzilla just goes back to hibernation. Then we get Son of Godzilla. Then we get Monster. Then we get other giant monster movies and all that being remade and being released. So yeah, Godzilla and Kong. I think Godzilla will definitely win. And I'm going to stand with that. And I'm going to stand. And I'm going to stand. Still stand with that. When God, if Godzilla loses, I'm going to go. I'll accept the feat. Today we're going to review Godzilla vs. Kong from 2021, I recently saw it today. Directed by Adam Wingar, and it's the sequel to Godzilla King of the Monsters, and also the third film of part of the Monsterverse series. It's been a while since I actually done one of these. Is like since last year since I done the My Academia video. Never, it's been like a while since I actually went to a place to actually see a movie at. Uh, not, of course, it's not going to be like some other guy's house, but as in like actual, you know, actual place where movies are played at and nobody's sleeping in. In case, actually, a couple of months, I think back in early March, or like, yeah, early March or, or late February, I actually got to see the Tom and Jerry movie at a drive in, yes. The driving experience was good, but the movie could have been better, that's the thing. Could have time to actually make a review, ooh, uh, a theater review of that, or else that will be the first. So I got to see the movie today at my local theater, uh, of after pestering my dad too much and all the, about how the film, he was convinced to actually take me over there. It's, this will be a non-spoiler review and a spoiler review. Ooh, so I'm going to put time codes in the description and all that, so that way you can actually avoid me giving out spoilers. In case, so the story is about a group of scientists trying to use Kong to find this location of, uh, basically this like unfamiliar location, and they want to know, hey, well, let's find out this is an actual place, you know. But meanwhile, Godzilla is going around on attacking innocent people and also doing several other things, you know, what Godzilla does, destroys buildings, Ings breezes atomic breaths, that's all over, and they're asking, huh, I wonder why Godzilla is doing this and all that. But then Godzilla and Kong eventually meet and fight off each other, and later on they do their final battle. Who wins? You go watch the movie. Or you could just sit down to review if you don't, if you're not interested in watching a movie. In any case, the movie? was really good. It did improve on the last film, Godzilla King of the Monsters and all that. Uh, where basically I said it had like some problems, but this one kind of fixed those problems and all that. The characters I did really like, some were actually interesting to know about. Basically follow two groups of people and all that. 
one of the groups has this character, which I'm not going to say, a hey, because as I was just mentioning the spoilers section, which I question, huh, it seems a bit unrealistic to have that character, or it seems a bit absurd in a way. The story was also really well done. I do like how it like changes and incorporates within its own own universe because this this is theoretically be re remaking the King Kong vs Godzilla from 1962 and all that. Uh, I do like how it like incorporates some of the things things within it. Uh, even though there's some like very far off like differences, I do really like it. The acting is very well done. The soundtrack was actually really great. Cinematography when the monsters are fighting each other and all that, like the giant kaijus are fighting each other, are actually, are really well done. And I, but I would say some of the cinematography for like some camera work for let's say when we are with the human characters could have been improved on. But also, this movie has a right, a right mix within the human story and when it's, and with its monster story. I noticed that people in the last film were complaining that basically, oh, too much monsters, like, like not much human plot. Not in the first one, but in Godzilla came the monsters and all that, uh, which I didn't really mind that much. But this one actually mixes it really well. Oh, like we see Godzilla and Kong what they're doing, but we also see what the our human characters what well, are. Well, the AR also doing and all that. The special effects were also really well done, even though CGI, I which isn't a negative to be honest, but it was really well done. I did really like it. Also, the director Adam Driver actually does a great direction with this film and all that. The first film I actually saw of him that he directed was unfortunately Death Note. It wasn't bad, but it was okay. Hey, but then I was like looking around this film and I was like, oh, all this neon, you know, we got like this type of music and all that, I was like, yeah, this is definitely Adam Driver <laughs> from just watching Death Note and all that for some reason. The sound design is really great and all that, and I really like how anytime like you feel like the when Kong or Godzilla is like about to approach each other, like Kong is running, they're, they're breaking buildings and all that, you just like feel your seat like just rumble and all that, which was really great. So I'll give it a 4 out of 5 stars. Now I'm going to get to spoilers and all that, so if you are satisfied with what I say, please click off the video or else I'm going to spoil the entire movie upon you or else the internet already did that to you. In any case, I didn't got to see the opening sequence, like after, I did saw the movie like after it's like opening and all that because we were actually running late to actually see the movie and all that, which was a bit disappointing, I like I couldn't see the title card and all that, so yeah. Basically, what comes to upon is that there's a lot of changes into the original, but there's also new or new things that are introduced and all that. One of them being is like basically their true motive. One of the true motives is like taking Kong and all that, like taking him from his island. So basically, Kong stole island, and according to the movie, there's like this storm that came across him and actually wiped off wiped off the natives except for the little girl and all that who who is able to actually communicate with. Is Kong, which is actually pretty interesting and all that. Basically, they communicate with sign language and all that, and so there's some humor within it. She calls one of the soldiers a coward and all that, like one of the characters. And basically, the someone interpreted they're like, "Oh, she told you that you are brave. You are a brave person." And later, that comes apart when he does these hand signals saying "coward," like we are very brave people, even though the way he's doing sign language just says we are very coward -hard people. Anyway, so that actually brought up some humor to him. The reason why they get Kong is because, so they're trying to get that, like, this certain material and all that, and it's uh, in this hollow earth sort of type of way, so they're going to try to get in there and find him. So basically they're like, hey Kong, can you, like, travel down there and all that, and Kong goes, uh, I don't know. So basically they capture him and all, uh, and basically the way they did was that instead of having Kong in his own island, they basically had, like, this giant dome thing like they have this giant dome thing convincing Kong that he's in this island even though he like figures out and all that where basically he's like the Truman Show where Truman played by Jim Carrey lives in this giant dome home um, even though it, and his life is an entire TV show basically with Kong but his life is not a TV show so basically they take Kong and all that and the first fight was really great I did really like the first fight when Godzilla and Kong are fighting each other the character I was mentioning of how absurd it is, who the two groups I was talking about, uh, basically there's actually more like three. There's like the villain group, 
you know, we have our main villain, I believe, from the last film. The other is the scientist, you know, with the girl and all that, and also who's also tracking down Kong. The other group is basically the Millie Bobby Brown character, like, basically is the character played by Millie Bobby Brown, and she basically gets a friend. This friend is not in the last movie, I remember. Her friend is not in the last movie and all that, uh, but for some reason they have this character. Which there's, there's no introduction, so uh, we just assume that they are friends and all that. Or they mention it in the opening sequence that I missed, because when I walked into the theater, or why, the, the first thing I saw on the screen was Godzilla basically going around the city, destroying everything, and, and that's where we get introduced the giant eye where we actually eventually see a, that eye to be Mechagodzilla. Yes, Mechagodzilla does appear in the film, even though it has been a long spoiler for like a month or so well, before the movie came out. Or maybe two months, I forgot. But basically, the character, there's this fictional podcast in the movie called the Titan Podcast. And for some reason, this character is like getting all this information and all that, you know, from the company Apex, which are, which these the villains in his like company and all of them. Uh, but basically, I was watching it, and I was like thinking, why do you have this type of character? Basically, they have this conspiracy theorist, this type of character, or making like having a podcast and all that, and Millie Bobby Brown's character actually, uh, actually finds him and all that, which his name is Bernie. He, but the thing is, I didn't even see why would they have the character. Sure, we need like a character to know this amount of knowledge, actually engage with the, the other, our main characters and all that, but I was like thinking, why the movie included it? That's the, that's what was my thing is, like why did, why did they had this character within this movie and all that? So basically it was like pretty absurd to my mind, the character, or Millie Bobby Brown's been listening to this podcast and all that, how this character and her father was like, you know, uh, this uh, nonsense is spilling into your brains, even though, I think this is a cliche where basically like main character says information, but other character says that's wrong information. Then later on, main character's information ends up being true. I think that's the type of cliche and all that where father doesn't think like, oh, you know, Godzilla falling like these sound waves or some sort of way looking for something. Yeah, that's not true. We're trying to cut me some slack here. So yeah, but basically the way they interact is basically like if they know on a basis, like okay, so here's what we're going to do and now we're going to track them down. Where the friend character is basically us as an audience, where basically we're just reacting to this like, wait what, we're actually doing this and all that? Oh, or you got your straight man type of character. So yeah, I think you should have like expanded on the human characters like in that area where basically we're like, wait, she has a friend, you know? Because I didn't remember that friend being in the last film and all that. To bring up Mechagodzilla, this movie, I feel like it was both a remake of Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla and King Kong vs. Godzilla. Mainly because the thing about the movie is that uh, basically Mechagodzilla appears throughout the film but doesn't show up until the final battle of the movie and all that. We are basically at the end of the movie when Mechagodzilla finally shows up and breaks out the facility and all that. Basically at this point Kong is like dying and he's about to die and all that until Kong like wakes up from electricity which was a pretty great tribute to the original film where basically King Kong Hung, hung in the original film is like power through electricity but basically it gets more strength if he consumes electricity whether they're being shocked by it or actually eating the electrical wires so I found that as like a great tribute to him. I was like in the theater, I was like, Jesus Christ, they actually brought that up. I never expected they actually will bring that up in the this movie and all that. Mechagodzilla is defeating Godzilla and all that, and Mechagodzilla is about to give the final blow to Godzilla. That is until um, Kong comes by and like dukes it out on Mechagodzilla. Then both Godzilla and Kong are now fighting against Mechagodzilla. And I was like, this is just Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla from 1974. Or basically Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, Godzilla and King Caesar both team up in order to fight against and to Mechagodzilla and they eventually succeed and all that. But it's been a while since I watched the movie so I forgot if Godzilla didn't end up like fighting against King Caesar afterwards. <laughs> in any case, 
But basically, it's like sort of like oh, uh, like two monsters like basically come basically were like you know we're going to sell our differences and deal with this nonsense. Basically, when they announced that one of them will actually fail, one, there's going to be one winner and all that. Like everyone was like saying, yeah, what if they actually like Godzilla and Kong teamed up and fought another monster? Uh, where basically they're saying like oh, what if they did it? It ended up being true <laughs> when people realized that Mecha Godzilla is going to show up in the movie, which is. Has been a long rumor before it was actually officially confirmed and all that. I heard from one person, I forgot what was his channel name, where basically he felt like Mechagodzilla was forced into it. Personally, I think Mechagodzilla incorporates well in the film, but it was kind of like a last minute show. But it could have ended like Kong like accepting the fee and Godzilla simply going back to the ocean and all that, and now we get our Final winner, the 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 the, the end title card coming from the ocean, going swords out of screen, copyright, legendary picture, Warner Bros. and Toho. It could have ended like that, but no. Basically, they pull up Mechagodzilla, where basically they're like expanding a bit more. Like I sort of feel that um, Mechagodzilla should have been present to the fight, but not in the way like basically he's like just standing there watching them both fight. Like Mechagodzilla should start marching and walking towards Godzilla. Uh, and Kong, and then Godzilla uh, uh, defeats Kong, and Kong just stays there. Then now uh, goes back to the fight to between Mecha Godzilla and Godzilla. It should have been like that, which could have been better. But they decided, you know, what? last minute, there's Mecha Godzilla. He's coming after you guys. I think they were sort of like, oh, what a twist, sort of type of thing. But no, it didn't really work for me, to be honest. Also, talking about the ending movie of who actually wins and all that. To be honest. I'm not sure who you call the winner of this movie. I'm not sure if there was a winner. Because in the first battle, Godzilla and Kong are fighting each other in like the best, like one of the best scenes. Where basically Kong is like just jumping from battleship to battleship. While like in the ocean and all that. Where Godzilla and Kong are like fighting each other and all that. Which is like one of the best scenes out of the movie. At the end of the battle, Kong is like just like, just like falls down on the battleship like goes, oh, I'm too tired. And Godzilla is about to turn back. I was about to go up to him, but then like some flares and Godzilla was like, you know what, I'm going to just leave now. I think in that round, Kong won, but they, but in the film says it, where basically now Kong gets this round and all that. They're basically saying like, oh, Godzilla won the first round at the back, at the ocean. Now they're fighting in land, and now they're going to be basically fighting around the... And basically, they're going to be fighting at Kong and all that. Which, when they reveal that they're going to Hong Kong, I was like, oh my gosh, Star Godzilla. If you don't know what I'm talking about, so basically, back in the early 1980s or so, this company known as First Films, which I forgot their actual name, but their company name is First Films, and they also made one of my favorite foreign horror movies, which is actually right here, The Devil from 1981, which is... Pretty cool, you know. It's actually a really good movie. Basically, they made an ad on Variety where basically they're saying Star Godzilla, uh, where basically it's like this Godzilla knockoff film. And in the Variety ad, they had like like a giant ape, which I'm not, which I'm sure is supposed to be Kong, Angerus, Godzilla, and also a few UFOs around on them. Anyways, and basically their tagline was when the new when the new world meets the old world sort of type of thing and all that. Toho was like, no! And actually got them to actually cancel the project and all that, but it would have been interesting to actually see Star Godzilla. Basically this Hong Kong produced Godzilla movie. Party would have been done on the cheap. Like, they would try effort, but not too much effort to actually look good. I'm thinking like that. When Godzilla appeared in Hong Kong, and I was like, oh my gosh, Star Godzilla, it actually came true. I'm not sure if the Hong Kong setting was attentional, like like go oh have you ever Star Godzilla? Let's do that as a funny joke, like for those five people who actually know about this. But the Hong Kong scenes, like when the Godzilla and Kong are fighting each other, where basically it's like the cityscape scene, and it's all neon for some reason. Actually, pretty good and all that. I really actually like the sounds when Godzilla was when Kong was just like beating Godzilla against against the buildings, and you just hear them clashing in with each other. I was like, ah, nice sounds, you know. I was kind of laughing at the film because of that. One thing to actually talk about the film is that basically there's skull crawlers in the movie, but they only appear for like five minutes or less. 
or basically, so we get to our uh, group, basically, let's call them our conspiracy theorist group, you know, Millie Bobby Brown, our friend, and also the conspiracy th theorist podcaster, or where basically they find a cargo, like there's like cargo transportation package and all that, and they basically are like, oh, look at this, let's go inside, when basically when they hear like doors being open, so they go inside, but uh, they realize that there's cr there, there's skull crawlers inside of it, like they're in like these egg form shapes and all that, like these eggs. And, and I was like thinking, oh, this is going to like show up later in the film. But basically, they are used to actually practice with Mechagodzilla, where basically they have the Ghidorah head some in some other room, and where basically they have the Ghidorah head and all that, where basically they're trying to use. Mecha Godzilla as a way to be against Godzilla itself. The skull colors, like one of them, is used actually eh, by Mecha Godzilla to actually kill and, and like a, as a practice and all that. And that was the last scene. You don't see them show up. Why skull colors? You could have been like some other fictional monster. Like we didn't need a introduction to that they had skull colors and all that. It could have been like, oh, here's a monster that we took. From somewhere else, it could have been something like that, like some forgettable name that you don't see anywhere else. And also, I do like the tribute where basically they named the scientist character actually makes the Mechagodzilla costume as Dr. Zarazawa. The name is from the 1954 Godzilla film, where basically Dr. Zarazawa creates the oxygen destroyer where he eventually kills Godzilla in that film. Final conclusion of the movie, where basically who actually wins. That's the thing I'm not sure about. I'm not sh really sure about because basically after Godzilla and Kong defeats Mecha Godzilla, both have like the stance at each other, but then they both walk away from each other and all. They, they just walk away like Godzilla just goes back to the ocean while Kong just stands there like, yeah, you go back there. I'm trying to interpret if Godzilla or Kong won or they just like saying like, Hey, we're a team, so we both won, you know. I'm not really sure, or I can interpret it as Godzilla or Kong winning and all. But out of all these Kong movies I have reviewed, which one I think is the best? I would say the original King Kong 1933 because how evolutionary it is. Also, King Kong vs. Godzilla. And yeah, that's basically... Yeah, I think those two are pretty good and all that. To be honest, the third place will come with King Kong 76. Hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope this video comes out on time, or else uh, I'm going to go, oh, man, I, this video came out late. Anyways, so that's all the episode. Have a nice day, and later on, come back to our video store.